Welcome back to the GTN Show. We have got a packed show today. Yeah, there's more discussions and talk about the water quality in Paris. The hardest geezer completing his run across the entire length of Africa. Yeah, Kenyon releases a new speed max. Ironman 70.3 Oceanside action, including the Race Ranger drafting device issues. And GTN welcomes a new baby. Starting as we always do with some of the stuff we've noticed on the internet over the past week. Uh, this one we actually was put on the internet over the, a week, the last week, but we knew about it a oh, bit I, before. I that. just found out. Oh, did you? No, oh, I no, no, we knew about it. Heather, our colleague, is off on maternity leave because she has welcomed little baby Magnus into the world. <laughs> Congratulations, Heather and Ben, on their new arrival. They're settling into life as a family of three. No. Yeah, very excited for it. Unfortunately, it means you won't see her on the channel for a little while while she takes care of baby Magnus. Uh, no word of when she's actually going to return, but she'll let us know when she's ready. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, congratulations to both. Um, and yet, moving on, uh, great news. Jamie Riddle from South Africa, who you know fairly well, yeah. um, has qualified for the Olympics, we think. I mean, I'm fairly sure he has. Yeah, <laughs> well, judging by his reaction on social media, we're pretty sure. Well, the, the story was he basically needed to qualify but was injured and triathlon south africa were like well you have to do these two races i think it was an african cup in in vintuk in namibia and then this one the uh, africa triathlon premium cup in nelson mandela bay this past weekend and you have to do both of them and finish top south african at both of them otherwise no chance it was very much like it's either this or, or you're out. Uh, so he went and raced the other one uh, with an injury, finished it and won it, or well, first South African over the line. Uh, and he's done that again, beating in the process Henry Schumann, who has definitely been South Africa's top Olympic distance triathlete for quite a while now. Uh, so yeah, it sounds like he stamped his ticket to Paris, which is, yeah, congratulations to Jamie. It's really cool. Yeah, congrats. And really stoked on that finish line by the looks of things. Yeah, well done. Um, and then moving on to... Um, a retirement from the sport. So the opposite end of the spectrum, really, with Jamie being a young uh, lad coming into the sport. Um, Nick Castellan has um, hung up his trainers, his bike, everything with that. Uh, so time to jump off the professional triathlon train. It's been a hell of a ride and I wouldn't change it for anything. Thank you to my family, friends, sponsors, coaches for allowing me to contribute to the triathlon world in my own way and live my dream. He goes on to say, I hope to give back to the sport by sharing my experiences and knowledge through my coaching business that's been developing over the years. Um, also goes on to say, right now, I'm running a lot. It's one of the simplest pleasures in my life and I'm motivated to see how fast I can go over 5K and up to 42 kilometers. Well, good luck with that and good luck on the next chapter. We're now on to try news and uh, a bit of news that we've been talking about for some time now. Will there be a swim leg in the Olympic Games triathlon? I'm not sure what's really news, it's just getting more and more pressing and still there isn't a solution. I mean, we're getting close now to that 30th and 31st of July when the Olympic Games triathlon is going to happen and there are still serious concerns about the water quality in the Seine River in Paris. Yeah, and they're hurriedly trying to clean up the Seine River um, and they estimate that this is costing around or in excess of 1.5 billion euros. It's an expensive triathlon. Dollars, sorry. Dollars. Expensive triathlon, that is. Yeah, that is very <laughs> expensive. Now, um, as we have mentioned before, they actually had to scrap the paratriathlon and the mixed team relay swims um, last year, and then also the 10 kilometer uh, swim for the World Cup or the test, um, test race that they had. Um, and I mean, it's not the first time that we've had concerns over the Olympic Games swim events or the triathlon swim. Um, there have been concerns at previous Olympic Games, but the difference is that these have all been either in the sea or in larger bodies of water, whereas this is a flowing river, which yeah. is harder to control in some aspects. Much harder to clean. They have put in all kinds of things, like a massive tank that can take rainwater treat it and then release it back. Uh, there's also a 10 kilometer stretch where they can almost siphon off some of the water that flows when it rains, etc. Again, treat it. There's also uh, a whole section that's got UV lamps above the water to try and get rid of the bacteria in that water. But it sounds like the water quality is still an issue. And World Triathlon and the organizers have also installed like a lab just upstream from where the race is gonna happen, where they can constantly monitor the water 
quality uh, and make sure that it is safe. Uh, now we say make sure that it is safe. There is actually a rule in the triathlon handbook that says the race can go ahead even if it's not within tolerable levels of water safety. Uh, that's kind of like an ability to overrule it. And the, the point is that World Triathlon will definitely say, we would never do that. We'd never put our athletes' health at risk. However, there have been a few races recently where most of the field have got ill after the event, like Sunderland and Hong Kong most recently. Uh, and they've blamed it on things like bugs that are going around the whole camp, etc but really it's most likely the water quality. And we don't really want to see that in Olympic Games, especially because the mixed relay happens just a few days after this, the individual event, and you don't want the whole field to be taken out of the mixed relay, do you? <laughs> yeah. Fingers crossed that it's not the 2024 Paris Olympic duathlon. Oh, that would be a real shame, wouldn't it? Um, particularly with just the location of it, where they get to swim, yeah. if they can get to swim. Will but, be yeah. an amazing event. <laughs> oh, well, stay tuned. Um, yeah, we'll be trying to update you as we go. Uh, moving on though, the hardest geezer has completed his run across the entire length of Africa. Yeah, very impressive this. 385 marathons in 352 days, including various trials and tribulations on, along the way, like being held up at gunpoint. And I heard, I heard a story the other day, robbed. he was actually held hostage by a village in the Congo for a couple of yeah, days. they put him on the back of, a, back of a motorbike and drove off with him and he thought he was kidnapped and was never going to be seen again. <laughs> it turned out he wasn't, but he, he did get through it all. He did get stuck in a few places when they had their passports nicked and other places where they simply weren't granted the visas until the last second. But he has made it all the way across Africa, 16,300 kilometers uh, in 352 days. Uh, it's, yeah. Now, he's done it for charity. He's raised, I think it's over 650,000 at this point, And obviously it's still going up because you can still donate to that. I think the aim is one million. Yeah, his goal is a million pounds for charity. Uh, and yeah, I think he might actually get there because globally it's gone in, on the news and everything and yeah. Uh, that's really good cause. However, <laughs> there's been a little bit of a, what, backlash maybe? Yeah, there's a bit of a dispute that's gone on in the last couple of days. Um, basically, Ross Cook, aka the hardest geezer, uh, is celebrating that he is the first person to ever run the entire length of Africa. Everyone's applauding him for that, including the people that are disputing this because they are obviously <laughs> very impressed and don't want to take anything away from that. However, it turns out he may not actually be the first person. In fact, he definitely isn't the first person to run the entire length of Africa. He may be in that certain direction, just not from south to north. Yeah, yeah. just not the first person to do the entire length. Yeah, there's a group called the World Runners Association who are a group of people who have successfully circumnavigated the earth. And they claim that they, one of their members, Jesper Olsen, was the first person to run the length of Africa or all the way back in 2010 when he traveled from Taba in Egypt to the Cape of Good Hope in South Africa in 434 days. Uh, and then also a British man named Nicholas Bourne has come forward to say that he ran the length of Africa from Cape Town to Cairo in 1998, covering uh, 10,000 kilometers and was certified by the Guinness Book of Records in 2000 for having the fastest traverse of Africa by foot. Now, actually, in a couple of the articles, both WRA and uh, Nicholas Bourne were contacted to well, basically, why did they not warn him earlier? Yeah, it's been doing for 352 days at any time, you could have pointed out there. <laughs> and it turns out, so in Nicholas Bourne's case, his friends did say, why don't you dispute this? And he said, well, I don't really have any interest in it. I'm just, I'm happy with what I did. Impressive what he's doing, leave him be. Obviously, now he's been contacted. It's like, yeah, look, I'm impressed by what he's done, but yeah, I've done it before. The WRA apparently were trying to reach out to him numerous times on social media. Very, they literally were trying to message him in any means they could and just didn't really get anything back. So here they are at the end and seeing it coming up on social media, on news outlets saying, first man to run the length of Africa. And like, well, hang on, no, or we've been trying to tell you. The problem is there's no organization that kind of oversees this and decides what the record is, what the route should be, what the, the start and end point should be, etc. So you're kind of free to claim anything. He's the, definitely the first person to run that particular route. And, and that's a really important point. He ran far further than Jasper Olsen yeah. um, because he actually did sort of a bit of a 
a, a loop at the end towards the, the point here. And not to detract in any way from his achievement, they did actually say, we should get the facts right. We have no problem with him claiming to be the first to run from the most southern point to the most northern point. But when he read is the first man to run the entire length of Africa, it's just not true from a facts perspective. However, it is still very impressive. And I think probably pretty strong claim to keeping the title of the hardest geezer. He's well on. <laughs> All right, now on to what the tech. Um, if you've been trawling the Canyon website recently, as I sometimes do, guilty, uh, you may have noticed that there is a new bike on the triathlon page for the Canyon Speedmax. So they've updated the Canyon Speedmax CF, which is one of their lower models, which it's important to point out that these lower models take inspiration and R&D from the top-end models, so you're essentially riding on the technology that some of the pros have been on for Trickle-down technology, yeah. And this is a decent upgrade, actually, to Very the good. previous CF7. They've included 750 mils storage and hydration, uh, which was often include, often requested. Uh, integrated storage and hydration. Uh, also integrated uh, cable and line integration across the whole range uh, now. Uh, they've actually said, they've tested it, and this CF at entry-level price is faster than Jan Frodeno's 2019 World Championship winning Canyon Speedmax. That's quite cool, isn't it's it? It's pretty, pretty, pretty cool impressive. stuff, isn't it? Just <laughs> yeah. a few years later, and you can get it for only 3999 yeah, um, that version actually comes with mechanical Shimano 105 um, and a power meter. And then their slightly higher price point of that same model um, comes with the with SRAM Axis. Um, yeah, for $5,499. Pretty good price point for a pretty fast bike. Okay, moving on. Uh, Form have also announced an update to their goggles. Yeah, so they've got the Swim Smart 2 now, which comes fully featuring integrated heart rate, a Digital compass, which they call the swim straight feature, uh, personalized head coach workouts, which they had on the previous model. I mean, in case you aren't aware what form goggles are, don't know where you've been, if so. Um, basically, it has augmented reality display within the goggles. So whilst you're swimming in real time, you'll be able to see your metrics. But now, also, these extra features too. Yeah, including continuous heart rate monitoring with an optical heart rate. I know, yeah, optical heart rate in the water. Can't possibly work. Well, apparently it does work. 97% accurate, uh, which is pretty good considering previously you would have no idea what your heart rate was other than your breathing rate because uh, any other heart rate monitor definitely didn't work or you couldn't look at your, your wrist anyway. Uh, and then, yeah, there, as we said, the swim straight function, which uh, uses an inbuilt digital, digital compass, compass to enable swimmers to follow in-goggle direction headings. Uh, not entirely sure how this works because we haven't got our hands on it yet. Um, like, does it just point you in a specific I'm direction? I'm going to assume so because I think uh, plotting out a course and then trying to follow a course is a recipe for disaster. But I think the idea is you will sight a boy, get a bearing, and then you can just pop your head back down in the water. Within reason, obviously, there's going to be currents <laughs> pushing you, so don't just <laughs> rely solely on this line on your goggles. But a really cool idea, and could be, at the very least, a really good idea for training just to kind of get yourself better at the sort of directions you're swimming in. I feel like a swim test video is on its uh, way so, yeah. soon. <laughs> yeah, they've also managed to make them 15% smaller despite adding accelerometer, gyroscope, magnetometer, and a barometer into the goggles. Uh, so they're still smaller. Yeah, and also a, a small, but well, actually probably potentially quite a big update is that they are making the shape of the goggles uh, better for a wider range of facial shapes and sizes. So, so they're more likely to fit your face now too. Exactly, so. Winning, yeah. winning, winning. Cool. Yeah. Uh, now, there's one more thing we noticed, and this is very much in the realm of what the tech. <laughs> so this yeah. is, it's called Monera, and it's, uh, it's the diamond saddle, and it's a wing saddle. So yeah, we trawled their website, and I've got to say, it's out there. It says basically, up for a board rather than sitting on a ski, and instead of your saddle going this direction, your saddle goes this I mean, direction. Obviously, I was and on it, that website for about 10 minutes, and I still don't understand how no. you sit on this saddle. <laughs> and also, throughout the entire website, and we looked at pretty much every page, there is not a single photo anywhere of someone sitting 
on the saddle on a bike, which you would kind of think is one of the first things you take a photo of, right? <laughs> uh, it's out there. It looks like a bat wing, basically, that, that sits on the rails and goes out sideways, and then you sit on it, and it's supposed to remove any pressure from the perineum and, you know, your private bits, uh, which in theory would be great for a saddle. However, as we say, trawling that, that website, it kind of looks like someone went into chat GPT or one of these AI generators and said, design an out there saddle that takes all the pressure off your perineum and design the website that sells it. And then they just go on, boom, and put that on the internet. <laughs> because I'm not sure this is going anywhere. <laughs> I give that a 10 out of 10 for what the tech. Okay, now it's time for race news, and we had a big race this last weekend. One of the biggest, in fact, the first in the pro race, in the Ironman Pro Series for the year, Ironman 70.3 Oceanside, and it started not so auspiciously. So for the first time ever, Race Ranger was going to be used at an Ironman event. That is the anti-drafting technology where you have a device on the front and back of each person's bike that shows the draft distance and whether people are close enough or, or too close uh, the whole time. And it's really a great tool for fairness in sport. We've actually done a video on it here on the channel. Uh, and on the eve of the race, it was announced that they won't be using it for the event. Mm. Now, apparently there was technical difficulties that were unavoidable, but very disappointing. Yeah, so I think in part, actually, what has happened is the event was almost oversubscribed. There were far more athletes than Race Ranger were expecting, or even Ironman were expecting for that matter. Race Ranger tried to resolve that by actually bringing out some of their newer devices, um, which required a bit of a firmware update. And throughout doing that, they ran into some issues with that firmware update. And apparently they're working around the clock right up until the final hour in which Ironman and Race Ranger just had to make a call on it and decided, yeah no race ranger for this event, we're just not ready for it. However, they said they will be ready for Texas, or at least they're very confident they will. So unfortunately, no race ranger at IMS 70.3 Oceanside. Yeah, with 80 men and 40 women, I think, on the start line was, yeah, frustrating. However, I'm not sure it really affected the results, which kind of went to the form book on the women's side in that everyone was tipping Taylor Nib to take the win uh, and she did not disappoint. In fact, she absolutely obliterated the field. I think there were quite a few male pros who were looking over their shoulders because <sighs> she was on fire. She swam 25-25 uh, just a couple seconds behind uh, Fenella Langridge out the water. So basically, I think she was just cruising on her feet the whole way. Uh, she, she then bucked a 2 18 bike split, which, I mean, in comparison, they say Emma Pallant Brown, who finished second, uh, she was almost 10 minutes quicker on yeah. the bike alone. Yeah, like two thirds of the way through the bike, she was had an eight minute advantage on anyone. Game over long before she even got onto the run. And she did run a 120 for the half marathon too. Uh, so yeah, she won with a 409.55 and Emma Pallant Brown was in second with a 420.49, over 10 minutes in behind her. Just a different league. In fact, Emma Pallant Brown crossed the line in second and then was promptly disqualified. <laughs> for speeding in a speed restricted zone through the military base, I believe. Uh, and then she appealed and was reinstated. And actually the exact same thing happened to Braden Curry in the men's race. He finished sixth and also got a disqualification as he crossed the line and also appealed it and also got reinstated. I'm sure they weren't the yeah. only ones that were speeding through <laughs> yeah. that speed zone. So, oh, but bit messy though. Uh, yeah, and it's Paula Finley that finished in third in a time of 4.21, just a minute behind Emma Pallant Brown, uh, Grace second, fourth, and Danielle Lewis in fifth. Yeah, and then on the men's side, uh, well, it would have been hard pressed to to pick this, but he was the defending champ. Lionel Sanders took the win, and he did it in style with a very impressive run. Uh, basically, him and Sam Long, he had the best swim he'd ever had in his, in his career, with only one minute 38 behind the leaders, which is still a substantial gap. Sam Long was another, I think, minute behind him out the water, uh, but Sam Long rode up in the power that he is at the moment, uh, and rode, took Lionel with him to the front of the race, uh, and then Lionel got off the bike and set to work, uh, yeah putting the sword to the rest of the guys, ran a 1.10.40 for that half marathon. To take the win in 3.46, Sam Long held on for second place with Jackson Laundry in third place. And then one of the pre-race favorites, Helle Gienz from Belgium, uh, took fourth. 
Yeah, very impressive racing, very exciting one to kick off with. Yep. Um, that's the only racing we had this weekend, but we've got an exciting weekend coming. First and foremost, because we've got the T100 in Singapore. Yeah, Ooh. second race in the series of the T100 series, and we see whether those first wins were flashes in the pan for India Lee and uh, Magnus Ditlev, or whether they are the ones to beat at all the rest of them. Uh, and another hot and humid race this one's going to be. Uh, some of them are already landing in Singapore to get ready for that heat and humidity. Oh, I've raced in Singapore. It is, <laughs> oh, it is, it is unpleasant. I mean, I'm not going to lie. I think <laughs> just, just walking around in Singapore is unpleasant. Box. Yeah. I've seen some videos on social media already, and you can kind of see the like humidity haze on like your phone. You pull it out your pocket to record or anything, and it's just like this this damp haze over you the whole time. Oh. Lovely. Uh, yeah, it's going to be good um, to watch. We also have the first round of the Super Tri E taking place this weekend in London. Um, on the women's side, we've got the likes of Beth Potter, Georgia Taylor Brown, Cassandra Bogran, Vicky Holland, Katie Seferis, and as we always get with these short course races, lots of names we maybe haven't heard of, but could, you know, they. It's an opportunity for them to really show their colours and have some impressive performance, like we saw Beth Potter doing many years ago. Yeah, they definitely mix it up with the top one. It's not to be confused with the indoor trial we saw last last week or a couple of weeks ago, where uh, there was on an indoor track and they were actually barking. This is uh, treadmills and Zwift related uh, indoor arena games uh, style. But uh, on the men's side, Johnny Brownlee, Chase McQueen, Hugo Milner, who is uh, coming up through the ranks and the fastest runner at the last WT uh, World Triathlon race, uh, Max Stapley and a, and a whole long list of other contenders. As Mark says, any one of those wild cards could uh, upset the apricot. Say what? All right, time to look at some of the comments under our videos from yeah. this past week. And one in particular that I was very excited about was my little run and jaunt around the hills with none other than Killian Journey. Yeah, life goals completed. Oh. Yeah. Mark is still buzzing uh, from this one. And I, I got to go on a run with Killian Journey. Yeah, it was a pretty cool video Did too. Did I tell you I went uh, yeah. Killian Journey? You mentioned it once or good. twice a day for the last six months. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Mark really enjoyed it and it was a good video. It was really cool. It was a really cool interview. And actually, uh, as Mark says in the video, there's quite a few more sound bites and, and in interesting questions in from fact, Killian that didn't make it into in that In fact, cut. spoiler, we talked actually in length about Christian Gustav Eden and the fact that he lives in Norway and all sorts of stuff around his interest in Olaf Alexander Boo, his coach. Stay tuned, stuff like that to come. Yeah, anyway, so that's dropping soon. You can watch that video now. However, these are some of the comments under it. Uh, in Dog said, what? Killian Jornet on the GTN show. I had to stop everything and watch this pure awesomeness. It was, it, it was cool. I, ah, I, I'll give it to Mark, yeah. Uh, and someone else said, Brent F said, I really have jaw drop moments, but when I saw the two heart rates side by side, wow. And that's yeah. in reference to, uh, they're running up the hill, they start pretty early on, and Mark's heart rate is already hitting 170s. And 180s, Killian's, I think, yeah, actually. <laughs> and Killian's is like uh, cruising along in the 130s, 140s. In fact, right at the beginning, Mark was straight up to 145, and Killian's still chatting away at 113, yeah. I think I had to ask him to walk. <laughs> <laughs> Literally had to ask the best trail runner in the world. Yeah. Do you mind if you walk? Poor Mark. He's uh, lived that one down. Uh, Mary Louise Orlando said, uh, great video and really nice to see your different uh, pulses and how effective he runs. We all know that Mark is a really good runner. Well, I mean, he's, he's okay. Uh, different perspective. So happy for you to have him as a guest. Well, yeah, we're also happy to have him as a guest. And of course, thank you to Koros for making it possible, our new Same. watch partner. Uh, stay tuned because Koros has a few other special athletes on their roster. And we'll be looking forward to uh, meeting them yeah. too. Uh, but yeah, if you want to check that video out, head on over and check that now. We actually have another video with Killian coming in the next couple of weeks too, so stay tuned for that with some various ultra running tips you might like ahead of your own ultra. Oh, I'll, uh, yeah, I should probably get those sooner rather than later. That is coming up quickly. Uh, another race that we did not too long ago, and that's coming out on the channel this weekend, which you definitely should look out for, is we took the GCN boys to a duathlon. Yeah, they had to run and then ride their bikes, but they really enjoyed, and then run again. And I've got to say, the runs before and after were significantly less enjoyable for the boys <laughs> than the rides in between. But we all had a lot of fun, and it is definitely a good video. So watch out for that coming out later this week. <laughs> 